Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, What Needs to Change at the FDA. My name is Caroline Rengo, and I am the project manager of Found Out. I will be going over the format and the instructions for the webinar today. Uh, we will first hear from, from our moderator, uh, Dr. Adrian Fu Berman, who will briefly talk about uh, the report, introduce our speakers. We're going to move on uh, to the presentations from our panelists. This will immediately be followed by um, a moderated Q&A session that we expect to run about half an hour. Um, at any time during this talk, please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A feature uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please do not put any questions in the chat as we might miss them. Uh, at this time, I would like to welcome our moderator, Dr. Adrian Fu Berman. Uh, Dr. Fu Berman is a professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Physiology and in the Department of Mem Family Medicine here at Georgetown University Medical Center. Uh, she is also the director of Found Out. And at this point, I'm going to pass it on over to her. Thank you so much, Caroline. Welcome, everyone. Um, let's see. It's um. I just wanted to say a word about Farmed Out first. So Farmed Out is a rational prescribing project at Georgetown University uh, Medical Center. Um, we do research and education um, on how industry um, affects the therapeutic choices of prescribers. Um, this is part of our, our team here. Next slide, please. I wanted to also to invite everyone to our conference next June 15th and 16th. It's going to be um, on Invented Diseases, Making Healthy People Sick, Invented Diseases and Overtreatment. Uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers and it, it will be right here at Georgetown University Medical Center in Washington, DC. Um, it's, we, people always love our conferences, so uh, please, please do come. Next slide. I'm very, very pleased to introduce today our Farmed Outs report on improving the FDA um, and our speakers, all of whom are, are members of our working group. Um, thank you to Arnold Ventures for funding this report, which enabled us to establish a working group of FDA experts and also former FDA staff. We held three meetings to establish the most pressing issues and identify possible solutions. After these meetings, Sharon Batt took a torrent of concepts and ideas and organized them, fleshed them out, contextualized them with, within extant literature, identified illustrative examples, and drafted a fabulous report which was then circulated among the working group and revised several times going through a number of iterations before being um, finalized. Um, and the, the, our working group are, are listed um, at the bottom here and the report is available um, on the Farmed Out website. Next slide, please. This webinar couldn't be more timely. We're, we're midway through a, a second FDA advisory committee meeting on Makina, an expensive version of an inexpensive progestin that received accelerated approval for preventing preterm birth, and which the FDA has been trying for years to withdraw from the market because it doesn't work. Makina provides a great example of problems with accelerated approval, starting with the name, which we think should be changed to conditional approval, the difficulties involved in getting ineffective drugs or dangerous drugs off of the market, and the undisclosed patient funding of patient groups, the, the undisclosed industry funding of patient groups, all, all of these are issues that we address in the report. We'll be talking about some of these today. So now I'm going to introduce speakers in the, uh, in, in the order that they will speak. Uh, Sharon Batt, John Powers, uh, Susan Mulchin, and Reshma Ramachandran. Um, I'm going to introduce everyone um, at once here. So Sharon Batt is an adjunct professor in the Departments of Bioethics and Political Science at Dalhousie University and also a research fellow at Farmed Out. Her latest book, Health Advocacy Inc., How Pharmaceutical Funding Changed the Breast Cancer Movement, is both an academic and insider analysis of the alliances between patient groups and, pharmaceutical, and the pharmaceutical industry. Dr. Batt's also a member of Health Canada's Scientific Advisory Committee on Health Products for Women, on the executive board of the Nova Scotia Health Coalition, and is member of the advocacy collaboration, Independent Voices for Safe and Effective Drugs. John Powers is a practicing infectious disease physician and professor of clinical medicine at the George Washington University School of Medicine. Previously, Dr. Powers was the lead medical officer for antimicrobial drug development and resistance initiatives at the FDA and co-chair for the US Federal Interagency Task Force on Antimicrobial Resistance. He's on the faculty uh, in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. 
Um, and he's been an investigator on over 60 clinical trials and is an expert on the design, conduct, conduct and analysis of clinical trials. Um, Susan Mulchin, until her recent retirement, was the lead psychiatrist at the Brain Injury Center at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. She also trained in nuclear medicine and did um, pet research at the National Institute of Mental Health and worked as the program director for biomarkers, diagnosis, and Alzheimer's disease at the National Institute on Aging. She was also for five years a medical officer at the FDA. Reshma Ramachandran um, is a family physician and assistant professor at Yale School of Medicine and co-director of the Yale Collaboration for Research Integrity and Transparency, CRIT, an interdisciplinary initiative that conducts strategic analyses to inform and evaluate policies supporting a more robust evidence base for FDA regulated medical products. Dr. Ramachandran's research focuses on realigning incentives for healthcare stakeholders to prioritize equitable patient access to safe, effective health technologies. Previously, Reshma was research faculty at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she focused on antimicrobial resistance and unaffordable prescription drugs. She currently chairs the FDA Task Force for Doctors on America. Um, next slide. Um, do keep in touch with Farmed Out. And now I am going to turn it over to Dr. Bat. Thank you, Adrian. And thank you to the whole team at Farmed Out and to my co-panelists and to all of you who have logged in. As a person tasked with writing this report, I needed to find a way to organize a series of rich tape discussions by people familiar at a deep level with how the FDA works. My other challenge was to support the various claims in the discussions with published articles from the health policy literature and elsewhere. My presentation is a quick overview that outlines the main themes in the report and provides a few examples of specific cases from the report that illustrate the need for change. The examples also show how I was able to support the report's arguments with reference to the literature. Next slide. I like to use a narrative approach to make complex ideas clear, and I decided the discussions at our taped meetings told a series of stories at three levels. There was an overarching narrative that tied the series of discussions together. Second, the participants decided on four main themes that everyone agreed were key areas for change. And third, each of the four themes encompassed sub-themes with case examples of discussion with of decisions that were problematic. This slide captures the overarching narrative. Has the FDA forgotten its purpose? Next slide. Here's an example of articles in a book published in the past 15 years that suggests that all is not right at the FDA. They're written by lawyers, physicians, professors, journalists, and they highlight what I call a discourse of concern about the agency. Next slide. That discourse highlights the question, what is the FDA supposed to be doing? This slide shows the FDA's mission and purpose as stated on the agency's website. It exists to protect, promote, and advance the public health. And it should do that by ensuring timely access to safe, quality products that the FDA regulates. Next slide. The mid-level narratives appear in the report as chapters titled Transparency and Accountability, Innovation, Balancing Pre- and Post-Market Standards of Evidence, and Value in Healthcare. These themes came right out of the initial Zoom discussion where participants discussed problems and came up with a list of areas within the FDA functioning that all agreed were of the most concern. Next slide. That takes us to the third level of narrative. Within each of the four chapters is a series of micro-level stories. These narratives explain the internal laws and policies that the FDA has developed over time to help it accomplish its mission. This slide highlights the narrative that undergirds the various strategies in the FDA meant to make the agency transparent and accountable, which is fundamental to promoting trust in the agency. Prescribers, patients, and payers all need to trust the FDA. They all rely on the agency to follow its own legislatively prescribed standards. To this end, the agency has developed an elaborate set of strategies to counter conflicts of interest among members of advisory committees, invited speakers, and members of the public who participate in open public hearings. Next slide. 
As an example of a micro narrative in this section, I've chosen here an actual case related to what is known as an intellectual conflict of interest. FDA policies assume that everyone with expertise in a drug or device who has uh, doing research in those areas probably has opinions relative to this specific drug or device. So the policy is broadly permissive. An expert who has expressed public views can participate on a committee unless there's evidence that they wouldn't change their mind, even in the face of overwhelming evidence that challenges their views. This example comes from a case in 2009 when a cardiology advisory panel was to assess a blood thinner called Prostugril, marketed by Eli Lilly under the brand named Effient. The drug was seen as a potential blockbuster. One of the panel me members, and there's a photo of him there on the left, um, a cardiologist named Dr. Sanjay Call, had written articles questioning the drug's safety. Eli Lilly contacted senior staff at the FDA to suggest that Dr. Call had an intellectual conflict of interest and perhaps should be removed from the committee. Dr. Call was removed from, from the advisory panel, which subsequently voted 9-0 to approve Effient. But numerous parties questioned his removal, including a late member of Congress, um, Maurice Hinckley, pictured there at right, and the advocacy group Public Citizen, as well as cardiologists who saw Dr. Call's removal as contrary to scientific ideals of debate and dialogue. Dr. Janet Woodcock, a senior member of the FDA staff, overall defended Dr. Call's removal, but said that errors had been made in not properly vetting him at the outset. It was fascinating to me to investigate these cases and the report includes a dozen or more. Typically, I found that each controversial case was well-documented in both the scientific and popular literature, as well as in the FDA's own records. Next slide. Innovation, the second mid-level theme, explores the question, what makes a drug innovative? A drug doesn't have to be innovative to gain approval at the FDA, and many are not. This section discusses why the very definition of the term innovation has become controversial at the FDA. The, the discussion gets into patent law and, pro, and programs the FDA has instituted that allow approvals of some drugs to be expedited or approved based on preliminary evidence. Next slide. This section includes a discussion of various promotional strategies that can encourage not only the rapid approval of drugs, but the overuse of drugs for which the sponsor's claims are exaggerated or based on limited evidence. Next slide. The third major theme, balancing pre- and post-marketing standards of evidence, is a big section about a shift in the way the FDA gathers and weighs evidence about a drug's safety and effectiveness. The report looks at what we call upstream changes, procedures that could be changed prior to a drug being granted approval, and downstream changes, or processes that need to change to address the shift to gathering post-approval evidence, called, often called real-world evidence. The shift to real-world evidence is now mandated by law. Next slide. The report argues that both pre- and post-marketing standards of evidence can be substantially improved. In the discussion of pre-approval changes, one section I found fascinating was about what panel participants called the level playing field norm, a powerful value within the FDA of which I was not aware. The idea is that the FDA should ensure that companies of all sizes get equal treatment, a good idea, but the norm doesn't always work to the benefit of patients. And in box 23 in the report, I discuss a case where an addictive opioid made by a small company was approved over the objections of the advisory committee on the grounds that the small company had to be treated equally with larger companies that had made and marketed addictive opioids. Next slide. Finally, the report discusses the theme of value in healthcare. This gets to the agency's purpose, which is to protect, promote, and advance the public health. Next slide. The FDA doesn't have jurisdiction over um, drug prices uh, of the product that it, that it approves or over the prices of the products it approves. 
yet the way the FDA decisions are made internally has an impact on drug and device prices. Drug prices are a huge issue in many countries, including Canada, where I live, but you only have to look at cross-country comparisons, as shown on this slide, to see that spending on drugs in the United States is far in excess of those in other countries. And I'll turn it over to John. Thanks, Sharon. So I'm gonna to touch on two of the four areas that Sharon noted, uh, innovation and also how the decisions made at FDA regarding approval affect value in healthcare as well. Next slide. So I'm gonna to touch on these three issues. One is defining innovation. What is it and what does this word actually mean? Which actually also encompasses a broader theme that uh, Adrian brought up at the introduction to this um, panel, and that is how some of these words that we hear, um, do they really reflect what we think they mean? Um, also, how that concept of innovation impacts FDA, and also how the concept of innovation impacts things beyond FDA in terms of value in healthcare. Next slide. So whenever we discuss efforts to improve the evidence and to bring costs in line, one of the counters to, to those discussions is always this notion of stifling innovation. So of course that means one has to know what innovation is if you know whether it's being stifled or not. In, in our discussions as a part of the group, we actually pose that innovation should mean better for patients on improving patient outcomes, not just that an intervention is new. So it seems that there's a disconnect then in how these words are used and their actual meaning for patients and clinicians. Is this really clearly communicating? Which as Sharon pointed out, clear communication is part of FDA's vision and mission statement. Or is this just another form of marketing of new products? Often new interventions are portrayed as innovative, but much of that innovation is based on untested hypotheses. For instance, I always think of this as, it's kind of like leaving your house and turning the GPS on in your car, and you can see where you're departing from, but you don't know where you're going. It doesn't give you a destination. So if a new product is a new class of drugs, by the way, that's another word with an unclear meaning. What is a class? Um, or it has a new mechanism of action or it's a new molecule. That's a great place to start. But how does that translate into improving patient outcomes? And unfortunately, several other countries like France and Germany who have done these kinds of analyses and looked back over time at the drugs that they have approved in their countries show that as few as 10 to 25% of those interventions actually have demonstrable evidence that those new interventions improve patient outcomes. So it seems like what we're left with for patients and as practicing clinicians is we have hypotheses that remain untested in terms of whether these things that are new classes or new mechanisms of action actually translate into improving patient outcomes. I don't think I've ever heard the words trust the science so much as I have in the last three years, but science is a process of testing hypotheses, not just assuming that hypotheses are true before they've been evaluated. Next slide. So the FDA mission statement, as Sharon pointed out, includes the actual word advancing public health. And by necessity, this means improving patient outcomes. Yet FDA claims that they're real, they do not have a relative efficacy standard. Now remember that this efficacy standard was passed in 1962 at a time when there weren't as many effective interventions to help patients. But one could pose like, is that really the standard that ought to be in place in 2022, now that we have a number of interventions that are effective, safe, and cost less than newer interventions? So, but FDA says that a new intervention doesn't have to be better than an older one. Um, there are exceptions to this, supposedly for contagious diseases and serious and life-threatening diseases when effective therapy already exists. This is outlined in the Clinton-Gore document that was published in 1995 and is also present in the Federal Register at that time. What's ironic, unfortunately, is this is the one place where FDA allows new drugs to actually be less effective is in infectious diseases that are serious and life-threatening, which would meet both of those criteria. So the focus now in the current era seems to be more on speed of drug approvals to market and the quantity of drugs approved with an assumption that more is better and access is better for patients, even if it's not clear whether those interventions improve patient outcomes. Next slide. 
So what has happened since 1992 with the passage of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, which you'll hear other speakers talk about, is a focus on faster approvals. But what seems to be a disconnect between the evidence in those applications and how fast they're getting put to the market. And these are called expedited programs. The, the report goes over many of these overlapping programs, many of which based are on financial benefits to the sponsor. For instance, if a sponsor published uh, gets a drug approved for a tropical disease, say tuberculosis, which actually is the most common bacterial killer across the globe. It's just not common, fortunately, in the United States. But if a sponsor gets a drug approved for, say, tuberculosis, they can get a tropical disease voucher, which then they can sell to another sponsor for millions to billions. So there's a clear financial benefit to the sponsors. But tuberculosis drugs these days are proved on a negative sputum culture, not showing that new tuberculosis drugs save lives. So that remains that these terms are rather misleading and imprecise. For instance, how can something be a breakthrough therapy before evidence is accumulated that it's a breakthrough or even that it's a therapy? As I always tell my patients, a therapy is something where the benefits outweigh the harms. We don't know it's a therapy. It's an experimental drug at the time it's being evaluated. So what this results in is a lack of evidence or evidence based on changes in a lab test. And a, a sponsor can get what's called a priority review, which means that that intervention can get through the FDA review process faster. And that means that benefits accrue to the sponsor because the faster they get to market, the more money they can make. But what gets lost in this is what benefit gets accrued to patients? So it's assumed that getting something faster to patients is actually better for patients. Yet again, there seems to be a disconnect between that evidence and actual patient benefits. New, new, next slide, please. So our, the report then makes several recommendations to try to address this. One is to reserve the term innovative and to develop incentives that actually go along with it for products that are designed to advance patient outcomes. Now, when I say designed, that means at the time that the drug is being evaluated. On the other hand, what we really need on the back end after the trials are done is actual direct evidence that those interventions improve efficacy, decrease harms, or decrease costs for patients. We should restrict the labeling of novel therapeutic entities to treatments that actually improve patient outcomes, as opposed to a characteristic of the intervention, like being a new class or a new molecule or a change in dosing. Um, we should avoid FDA language that implies that all drugs that get a priority review or some special uh, expedited program automatically have benefits for patients unless those benefits have been demonstrated. And in FDA communications, they should underline the basis for why those approvals occurred. And that is that the product is deemed to have overall clinical benefit by virtue of its safety and efficacy, but that's in isolation from other products and does not mean that that intervention is better than older effective agents that may be less expensive. And sometimes the FDA communications imply that the new invent interventions might be better when in fact the, the evidence for that is lacking. Next slide. So how does this all impact things beyond FDA for those of us that are practicing in medicine and also in terms of what our patients have to pay and also what we pay as taxpayers. So in a functioning market, new products that are approved for marketing without added patient benefits wouldn't sell. They may actually decrease the cost by supply and demand as more of interventions come onto the market. One would expect that the cost would go down. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen because the market is often altered by patent extensions and exclusivities, which are often based on minor changes to the molecule, again, without clear benefits to patients. So if the market does function, for example, in the setting of new antibiotics, which have no evidence of added benefits for patients, and yet FDA has approved a number of them, in fact, 15 over the last six years. But those, those drugs have not done well in the market because they don't have added benefits, but they cost more. So now the next idea is to get the taxpayer to pay for it. There's a bill that's being promoted now called the, the very wittily named Pasteur bill, which wants to pay a, over a billion dollars per drug for new antibiotics, even if they lack evidence that they improve patient outcomes. One of the things that does seem consistent is that new drugs usually are more expensive than older alternatives, even though they lack evidence for improving patient outcomes. And the report goes through some of the reasons for this. Because of these patent extensions and exclusivities, 
The sponsors of those drugs have effective monopolies and can block competition. There's also up until recently a lack of negotiating power of the US government to negotiate for lower prices. And even the bill most recently passed only allows limited negotiating power for the new US government on a small number of drugs. And it's still yet to be decided how that's gonna play out in the real world. And then there's delays or absence of, of cheaper generics that might actually lower the cost to people in, in clinical practice. One of the other issues is there is a lack of broad use of health technology assessments in the US. There are some groups like ICER who do this independently of the US government, but in most developed countries, there is a separate health technology assessment group which evaluates the value of the interventions. So the regulatory agencies may approve those interventions for marketing, but then the health technology assessors decide whether or not those things are worth paying for or not based on their added benefits to patients. Next slide. So back in 2010, Michael Porter, who was a Harvard business professor, actually published this piece. And the reason I want to show you this is because I want to em emphasize this is a decade ago that people have begun talking about the idea of what is value in healthcare. Next slide. So what Porter actually points out is that value in healthcare is defined as improving patient outcomes. Yet the reason we spend so much money in the US and don't have as good a health as other countries is because our system focuses on processes of care rather than measuring outcomes and trying to improve the outcomes for patients. So this isn't as much to fault FDA as, as it to say, FDA is part of a bigger system that doesn't look at patient outcomes. The FDA claims not to consider cost when it's making a decision about approving a drug, yet what they do, as Sharon pointed out, indirectly affects the cost of healthcare. Now, although the FDA says they don't take this into account, some approvals such as the approval of the drug for muscular dystrophy because at a person, that drug actually had in its review a comment by the center director raising concerns that the company should be capitalized so they can, should continue to develop the drug. That seems outside the purview of FDA and the kinds of evidence it should be considering. So since new interventions cost more, even if they lack evidence of, of added benefits, this can also cause what's been referred to as financial toxicity for patients and for society. One of the things I always have discussions with my patients about is it's not just them that's paying for this, it's all of us who pay in the form of taxes and also um, a higher insurance premiums as well. New slide, next slide. So lastly, there is no incentive for sponsors to develop better products under the current system. If one could get paid for developing a drug that only improves a laboratory test, then why would one decide to put the effort into developing a better product? They can then obtain approval and attempt to require government payment through the Center for Medicare Services, et cetera. And in fact, one of the things that you'll hear some more about the other speakers is the uh, Alzheimer's drug was one of the first times when the Center for Medicare Services decided not to cover an intervention. But these products are marketed as if they have added patient benefits, which actually makes it harder to study them to figure out whether they do have benefits or not because it's implied that they already work. The wording in the drug's labeling implies superiority. So for instance, antibiotics have been approved recently for patients with quote, limited or no options. Yet patients with limited or no options were not studied. Therefore, for us as practicing physicians, we don't know whether the drugs actually work in those people or not yet the label implies it's been studied in those patients and that that new drug is better than older, less expensive and better studied alternatives. The last thing that, that really rarely gets discussed is the opportunity for cost in, in terms of cost to patients that they could be on something else that does work if they're taking something that doesn't. And also the massive waste of resources, especially since many of these drugs have significant public investments through NIH and other agencies that help fund the development of these products. Next slide. So I'll finish up with this. There's some more in this in the report about some recommendations of how to address this. And some of the other speakers are gonna get into more detail about this as well. But a recent Commonwealth Fund listed four strategies that other countries have used to control costs. Number one is negotiate prices, which we've already talked about. Number two is basing the price on a drug on its clinical value on demonstrated evidence in improving patient outcomes. Meaning that if a drug gets improved on a laboratory test, it would get reimbursed less than a drug that gets approved on improving survival or patient symptoms or function. 
Also to use both international and domestic reference pricing instead of charging what the market will bear in a particular country, and then limiting patent extensions that lengthen a drug's market exclusivity period if in fact that change in the molecule really doesn't improve patient outcomes. So let me finish up there and I will pass it on to uh, Susan at this point. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to talk about one of the accelerated, one of the expedited approval programs, accelerated approval. That pathway was established in 1992 in the wake of the AIDS epidemic in an attempt to get promising drugs to market more quickly. Uh, it's meant for serious, life threatening health conditions. And it's for potential new treatments that have a good chance of offering to be more effective and or safer than drugs currently on the market for a condition. Uh, a big stipulation or a, a part of this pathway is the drugs going through this can use surrogate endpoints for their outcome measures. A surrogate endpoint is a biomarker or a test, as Dr. Powers mentioned a bit about, a blood test or an X-ray or other imaging test that can be used instead of an outcome measure, uh, such as a decrease in symptom or, or survival. It's a kind of an intermediate, intermediary endpoint, but it needs to re be reasonably likely to predict the endpoint that we care about, survival or increased functioning or decreased in symptoms. Um, an example is in HIV disease viral load in blood. The amount of HIV virus in the blood uh, predicts that a drug will improve survival in HIV and decreased disease progression, for example. Uh, LDA cholesterol uh, for statin drugs and cardiovascular disease is, a, is another example. So also part of the accelerated approval pathway is that if the drugs are approved based on one of these surrogate endpoints, confirmatory clinical trials need to be done to document that they actually do what they're supposed to do, um, uh, change the endpoint that we care about, a decrease in symptoms or improvement in function or survival down the road. Um, so these need to be done um, and after uh, after the drug is approved through the accelerated approval pathway. Uh, next slide, please. So I've illustrated um, what uh, 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 an example of a surrogate and endpoint that caused a lot of controversy earlier this year. And that has to do with a drug approved by the FDA for mild symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, aducanumab. And this is a slide of um, PET scans that label the abnormal protein amyloid that is deposited in brains to an abnormal and, uh, amount in patients who have been diagnosed with, with what we call Alzheimer's disease. The top row of scans is a patient with, with Alzheimer's disease, different brain, you know, cross sections of their brain. The red um, is labeling the abnormal protein in their brain amyloid, so there's a lot of it. Um, and the lower row of scans is someone, uh, a normal volunteer with, with no dementia, with no symptoms. So these amyloid scans were used as the endpoint, the uh, surrogate endpoint in the trials for the uh, aducanumab uh, studies. Um, there were clinical endpoints as well. Um, these turned out to be, uh, to show the drug just, just didn't have the effect as, as hoped. They, they didn't show overall a positive effect. So the drug, despite uh, uh, recommenda recommendations from the uh, advisory committee not to approve the drug, the FDA went ahead and approved the drug, uh, approved the drug anyway. Um, and the problem with that is um, from what we can see, you can see the scans on the top line with a lot of, uh, a lot of red labeling with the amyloid. That can also happen in somebody who does not have any dementia symptoms. You can have a head full of that amyloid, that red labeling, and still not have memory symptoms. So the amount of amyloid has not turned out to be a reliable marker of cognitive functioning, including in past clinical trials. There have been other drugs that have decreased the amyloid in brain, cleared it out, but 
again, their clinical endpoints have not have not shown improvement. So this caused a, a, a big a big controversy. Uh, next slide, please. So given the uh, controversy surrounding Agihelm, the uproar, um, the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General um, decided to do a report to study the accelerated approval uh, pathway. And again, this meeting is very timely. This report just came out a few weeks ago and they uh, reviewed the pathway over the almost 30 years of its existence and found that um, almost 300 drugs have been approved through it. Um, 104 of these have incomplete confirmatory trials. Um, of those, over a third have at least one trial past its due date. Uh, um, so these, these, as is well known, these, these trials that are promised um, after the drug is approved through a surrogate endpoint just aren't being completed. Um, they also found that 13% of all accelerated approval drug applications have been um, withdrawn from the market. They also looked at the, um, as John said, the, the financial toxicity to the, to the taxpayer that um, the drugs with no cl proven clinical benefit uh, as approved from this path pathway have cost just in the past three years, $18 billion to taxpayers. Um, some of these have even proven lack of benefit. And um, Adrian mentioned Makina earlier, um, a drug that the most recent clinical trial showed a clear, clear again, lack of benefit. And the FDA has been trying to, trying to, uh, to withdraw that. Um, so besides the financial hit, um, you know, uh, uh, having drugs on the market that, that don't work, Makina, other, other drugs, that aren't confirmed to work raises false hopes in patients. And John also alluded to the opportunity costs. Um, huge resources are, are put into developing uh, drugs. Once a drug is approved uh, through a, a pathway, accelerated approval or otherwise, uh, companies uh, see that as, a, as a, a map and develop other drugs in a copycat effort, often of the same mechanism. And we end up with um, maybe several drugs with with no or marginal benefits rather than using those resources that might be better put to something that might be more beneficial to people. Um, next slide, please. So what to do? Um, uh, the white paper talks a lot about what needs to change at the FDA. And there was an act introduced uh, in the house uh, earlier this year, the Accelerated Approval Integrity Act that uh, also uh, mentions a lot of the changes um, mentioned in the, in the white paper. Um, you know, have the follow-up studies planned and designed before the actual approval, um, have a, a automatic expiration of the drug uh, happen. If those studies aren't completed, have a clear process for removal from the market um, uh, and, and lots of other things that are, that are detailed in the white paper. I'm gonna leave it there and, and turn it over to Reshma. Thanks, Susan. Um, um, so we can go to the next slide. I'll be talking a little bit more about structural changes at the FDA that's preventing a lot of the reforms that were discussed both by John and Susan from actually happening. Um, these are under my disclosures. I have no financial interest with any pharmaceutical or medical device companies. Next slide. So, you know, the big question is, you know, could FDA make the changes that were discussed today? The accelerated approval reforms that Susan talked about that are discussed uh, more deeply in the paper. Um, what John um, spoke about in terms of FDA setting or resetting really the standards for innovation by improving regulatory standards and also a number of the other proposals that are within the white paper. And in short, the answer is yes, um, but there are some structural issues with the agency that prevents that from actually happening. Next slide. And for that, we have to kind of do what the old adage says of follow the money. Um, and you can see here, this is um, a graph from the Congressional Research Service that actually outlines um, FDA's budget over time. And on the top part, um, the, the grayish brown part, um, you'll see user fees. And underneath that is a budget authority or basically what Congress has appropriated to the agency. Um, here, you can see there's been an increased reliance on what's called user fees. And just in short, user fees are payments by the regulated industry, drug devices, and also tobacco, animal drugs as well, um, that are paid by the companies who are seeking approval for their products. 
Um, and in exchange um, for those fees, FDA is able to hire reviewers, um, other staff, and also undertake new pilot programs, including a number of the expedited review programs that initially started off uh, as pilot programs that are now a part of um, the regulatory um, pathways that we see today. Um, and you can see in this graph that over time, there's been an increased reliance of the agency on these user fees, um, much more so and much more steeply rising compared to what Congress is appropriating um, in order to meet the demand of more and more products um, being um, sent to them for consideration for approval. Next slide. Um, this is just another um, figure, this is actually from the FDA itself, that just shows kind of the imbalance across a number of areas that are um, a part of FDA's work, where there's been an increase in user fees over time. Um, but this for FY21, uh, 2021, the ones I wanted to point you to is prescription drugs. So if you go from the second from the bottom, you'll see that basically 65% for human drugs is funded by industry user fees. So this is again, money that's paid by the regulated industry um, to the regulator. Um, for biologics, a significant amount, same thing for devices. And you can imagine um, what actually occurs um, or what actually is a result of having um, such industry user fees going to the agency. But to kind of talk a little bit more deeply about that, um, we can talk about um, the process for user fee negotiation. Next slide. So it'd be one thing um, if user fees were um, you know, given to the FDA and FDA had full discretion to actually determine how the fees would be used. But that's actually not what occurs in practice. It's actually a negotiation um, between FDA and the regulated industries over what the scope of the user fees um, can um, apl be applied to. Um, so the left, if we go from left to right, um, industry and FDA meet years in a, in a couple of years in advance um, of what we call the FDA user fee reauthorization process, which happens every five years. Um, they meet behind closed doors um, to discuss um, priorities for the FDA and also for industry. And industry basically says, like, you know, this is what we want the user fees that we're paying to you to be paid for. Um, and these um, meetings happen without any sort of observers from um, the public sector, um, folks that are independent, patients, clinicians, and others to actually chime in um, in terms of you know, what's being negotiated between industry and the FDA. FDA has separate meetings, um, and this is after a lot of advocacy from a number of groups um, to actually have um, public stakeholder meetings, but there's a huge imbalance between um, the number of meetings that FDA has with industry and the number of meetings that FDA actually has with public stakeholders. And even the composition of public stakeholders is questionable at best. Um, we've done some analysis um, around this, and in the last year alone, for the most recent user, user fee cycle, um, we saw that FDA actually met with industry 113 times compared to six meetings with public stakeholders. And in response to public stakeholders asking for some of these reforms that were discussed, um, post-market surveillance, um, things around accelerated approval reforms, FDA said thanks but no thanks to their suggestions, being beholden to what industry had already negotiated with them in exchange for the user fees. Um, on top of that, um, then um, from this user fee negotiation, this becomes the crux of a bill um, called the FDA Reauthorization Act or User Fee Reauthorization Act that gets passed every five years in Congress. And this is what um, Congress starts off um, as their kind of their anchoring point for user fee legislation. Next slide. Now we can see here, this is a study that was done by um, a group at Memorial Sloan Kettering um, that was led by an oncologist named Aaron Mitchell, where they actually looked at trends in user fee negotiation over time. And this actually reflects a number of the trends that were outlined in the report in terms of decreasing regulatory standards with each user fee process, allowance of test tube studies and other things um, to be used as the basis of approval um, for uh, new drugs and also devices. Um, an increase in expedited review pathways or shortening of approval times for new products, an increase in intellectual property incentives, such as exclusivity periods that prolong monopoly price protections, and also an increase in industry and sponsor involvement in FDA decision making. Um, so more allowances actually for closed door meetings um, and more collaboration with the FDA along the drug approval process. And we saw this very glaringly with the Alzheimer's disease drug aducanumab, where there was actually something called Project Onyx, um, where um, Biogen and FDA had a number of closed door meetings um, that uh, seemingly seemed to influence their ultimate approval. Next slide. 
On top of that, um, this also leads to, um, you know, how FDA like tracks success and what they prioritize. The user fees are hinged on this idea of completing approvals within a set period of time. And you can see that um, in their user fee reports that re they release annually in terms of, you know, how it's going in terms of their usage of the user fees, um, they report primarily on speed and rarely on you know, what this means in terms of patient outcomes. This, of, this is oftentimes done by independent researchers like, such as our groups and others that are on this call um, to actually look at you know, what is FDA prioritizing in their approval process over time. And we can see um, that the user re reports kind of show you know, what FDA um, you know, is beholden to both by the industry user fees, but also what they're prioritizing in terms of their activities and their resources. Next slide. So, you know, a part of this, you know, what, one of the recommendations that has been talked about in the report, but also kind of, um, you know, bigger picture in terms of what the user fee um, um, process um, should actually look like or how, at least in the short term, um, can actually be adjusted is thinking about what are the outcomes we actually want to see from the user fee process and how can we make sure that they're recentered or really around patient interests and public health interests. Um, you know, at the end of the day, what gets measured gets managed. And these are the sorts of metrics that would reflect, you know, where are their gaps, particularly around safety and efficacy of new drugs that are getting approved by the FDA, whether or not FDA is um, prioritizing, making sure that um, with expedited review pathways and its increased reliance on post-approval studies, that these are being completed in a timely manner, and whether or not the findings of those studies actually lead to regulatory action. And so these are some of the kind of proposals that have been put on the table um, in terms of what the annual user fee reports should look like instead. Next slide. On top of that, you know, um, in the short term, thinking about resetting the negotiating table and the terms, again, not having um, a separation between industry and public stakeholders, a need for transparency over the negotiation process and really input from public stakeholders right from the get-go that has parity with industry um, alongside the, with the FDA in terms of what the user fees should be used for. Balancing inclusion of some independent public stakeholders with industry representatives. Um, and I stress the word independent because a number of public stakeholders oftentimes serve as megaphones for industry representatives due to conflict of interest and financial relationships with them. And then also ensuring that the user fees can actually be used for public health priorities like the ones that were discussed on this call and not just faster approvals that are based on less evidence. Next slide. And of course, um, this kind of leads into kind of the ongoing discussions right now in terms of the riders that usually get attached to uh, user fee legislation, you know, the ability for Congress to augment, um, in addition to what obviously FDA has negotiated with industry already in terms of the use of user fees, what else Congress could authorize the FDA to do. Could, to do. And a part of this is a number of, um, you know, pieces of legislation that we've been hardened to see that were introduced as a part of the user fee process um, that were very much public health and public interest writers around accelerated approval reforms, clinical trial diversity, and regulation of supplements, cosmetics, and in vitro diagnostic tests. Unfortunately, what we saw with this last user fee go around is that these were actually uh, removed from the user fee bill in favor of a quote unquote, and what's really a misnomer, um, a clean user fee bill that's just what FDA negotiated with industry behind closed doors. And so we're hoping that with the end of year spending bill, as there's commitments from both the Senate and the House, that these reforms will be enacted. Next slide. And then just as a kind of a last consideration, you know, for longer term stru structural changes, you know, cognizant that FDA has to meet a huge demand, you know, dealing with two pandemics, multiple public health crises. On top of that, you know, there are ongoing activities for regulation of drugs, devices, food, cosmetics, you know, a number of products every 25 cents on the dollar. Um, that there needs to be sufficient resources and funding. However, at the end of the day, it's clear that there needs to be a truly independent FDA, and this should happen through independent um, and increased congressional appropriations, where FDA um, actually you know, takes into account public interest um, considerations, including the number of reforms that were discussed um, earlier on the call. And this has been supported by a number of folks, including folks like um, the current FDA commissioner, Dr. Rob Califf, um, who's recently said he wished that there was not user fees and the taxpayers paid for all of the FDA. And also um, Senator uh, Richard Burr, who's a ranking member on Senate Health that ultimately advocated for a clean user fee bill.
um, that only had user fees, again, with what um, industry prioritized with the FDA. Um, I think that's my last slide. Thanks so much. Thank you all very much. Um, those are really excellent presentations. We have several um, questions here from the audience. Um, so from Nick Mendola, do you ever see the FDA incorporating cost effectiveness evidence and other HTA practices like ICER into approval decisions? For anybody. So part of that is the cost of the drug isn't known at the time that FDA approves it that the drug gets approved and then the sponsor decides how much they're gonna charge for it. There is a section in FDA legislation actually that allows sponsors to present data to um, uh, pharmacy and therapeutic boards, et cetera, that actually could show the cost effectiveness of their products. But that's not something that FDA per se reviews. The, the, just the one thing I'll bring up is that it was kind of interesting actually with the recent ALS drug that was under consideration by the FDA um, at, a, at an advisory committee meeting, Amelix, um, just, you know, just in the past few months, that there was a discussion around price um, of the drug in terms of the opportunity cost. One of the advisory committee members actually brought this up in terms of, you know, this drug was being approved. It had a missed primary endpoint in some ways in terms of um, mortality in particular, there were some functional endpoints that were met um, and there was con concerns around like the, the level of evidence. There was this kind of quote unquote pledge from uh, the industry representative or from the sponsor that um, they'll take the drug off the market once their phase three study is completed, that FDA, you know, tried to put out as, a, as an indication that, um, you know, the drug can be approved because they could potentially withdraw the drug for the market or the sponsor we would willfully do so. As we see with McKenna right now, that's not really happening as planned. Um, however, one of the advisory committee members brought up the question around price because they knew the price in other countries was like over $100,000 per patient. And what would that mean in terms of potentially offering patients something that is not known to be clinically beneficial, but very costly? What would be the opportunity cost of that? And so that was like one of the rare times I've actually seen FDA officials kind of talk about this, but they quickly kind of dismissed that out of hand as a consideration um, for their recommendations around approval. A um, question here about what about automatic withdrawal of drugs that don't meet their confirmatory trial endpoints, or if the drug company doesn't complete the confirmatory trial in time on time, how hard would it be to get that into practice? So that's, as Susan mentioned this with the Accelerated Approval Integrity Act, that was actually initially proposed by Congress um, to actually have something similar to what other countries, including Europe, you know, Switzerland, and the UK, they have this idea of conditional approval that actually has an automatic expiration if the confirmatory trial is not done in a timely manner or does not show clinical benefit. Um, so we tried to actually get that passed here in the US and industry and actually even FDA folks kind of push back against this. Um, saying that accelerated approval is not conditional approval. And so they were more comfortable with having a process instead that was more efficient around withdrawal. We're seeing right now, like the difficulties obviously with withdrawing a drug, even with a failed confirmatory trial with McKenna. It's two advisory committee meetings later and there's still a hot debate about this. Um, and so, I mean, it's there's a lot of issues around political will, both from FDA side. FDA could do this. There's nothing in the statute that prevents them. I'll, I'll just put that out there. Nothing in the statute that prevents them to do this, but they decided to adopt a policy with an FDA to kind of go through this lengthy arbitration process and now are looking to Congress to authorize them the authority to do so. So it is complicated to say the least. I, I think there's a middle ground on this. And uh, right now, sponsors, and I think uh, Susan brought this up too, sponsors are getting paid as if they've already done the confirmatory study before they've done it. Another way to look at this was that, is that the reimbursement should go down. Well, it should start off lower, first of all, and then should continue to decrease until the confirmatory trial has been done. I think what will happen if there's an automatic withdrawal, there'll be a lot of pushback from patient advocacy groups talking about how there's not access to this drug. Well, here's one way to keep access and you don't get paid. So I think that would at least, part of what I think this report goes into a lot, and it seems to be reflected in all four sections, is the incentives are in the wrong place. 
So actually putting the incentives in the right place, why would you do the confirmatory trial as a company? You're being paid as if you already did it. You complete the trial and it succeeds, you get nothing. You don't complete the, tr you complete the trial and it fails, your drug's off the market. So right now the incentive is all in the wrong place. So maybe adjusting the pricing to reflect value, which by the way, ought to happen for all drugs, not just those approved through accelerated approval. Um, wh why do we think that we should call accelerated approvals? We make the recommendation in the report that we should call accelerated approvals conditional approvals as well. And uh, another questioner says there's been regular use of unclear or misleading wording. How can the FDA improve on this uh, to benefit patients and providers? Well, there's clearly nothing that requires FDA to use this terminology. It's their choice of what to use. Um, and and I, I agree with whoever answered asked that question. You ought to you know you ought to call it what it is. It's conditional approval. We don't know that the evidence is there yet. Um, and some of these things like breakthrough therapies almost seem um, erroneous on their face. You can't possibly know something's a breakthrough at the point in which they give that designation. So it would be much better to you know call it what it is. An accelerated approval sounds so positive. It sounds like this is really a wonderful, uh, a wonderful drug. Where conditional approval uh, makes it, it sound like we don't know yet. So that would certainly language is really important. Language is important. And again, the the FDA. I mean, who are they working for? Um, yeah. More and more, it looks like corporations versus valuing public health. Yeah, these do sound more like marketing terms than scientific terms. You know, it's interesting when I, when I work with fellows and residents on writing scientific papers and there'll be terms in the paper like, well, obviously, or importantly, and I always tell them to take those words out because your evidence should show whether it's important or obvious. You don't need to tell people that. Right. And I think it's the same thing for these kinds of, of words attached to these programs. And, and just to note that two thirds of new drugs qualify for some kind of an expedite, expedited uh, right. designation and a third of them qualify for, for three or more. So these can be layered on top of each other, something we also address in, in the report. And anytime you're calling something a breakthrough, a priority, et cetera, it really gives consumers the wrong impression. I think we could see some of that in the Makina um, advisory committee uh, meeting over the last couple of days, but this was approved under accelerated approval <laughs> as though that, that gave it extra special. Uh, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, and there's been, sur there's been surveys of clinicians in terms of asking their understanding mm -hmm. of like, what does a breakthrough therapy mean? What does accelerated approval mean? And, you know, all of us, you know, have like the fortune of being able to kind of dive a little bit more deeply in issues on FDA. But for a practicing clinician, it, you know, the, we're reliant on the FDA just to make sure that if a drug's on the market, it's safe and effective. And so when you use terms like accelerated approval and breakthrough approval, these surveys have shown that for usually, you know, clinicians who are not steeped in FDA issues think that it means it's a better designation. It's a shiny kind of new label for something that is even more beneficial for their patients than what else might be on the market. And in truth, though, there is a role for interventions like that. Right, a, an intervention where the evidence clearly shows added benefits on an important outcome for patients ought to be prioritized. What's happened is this has been watered down, as Adrian said, to so many drugs that don't meet that standard. Yeah, absolutely. So how important or detrimental to the approval process is the flow of personnel between pharmaceutical companies and regulators? Um, the, what's been called the revolving door. Uh, are there methods to monitor or control this? Yeah, I mean, the revolving door is um, fairly rampant. There's been a lot of really good studies recently to kind of show the extent of this, um, including by some journalists. Um, I will, I'll say one of the things today that was kind of striking is um, the lead attorney for COVIS, who comes from Sidley Austin, was the former FDA chief counsel. So it was interesting. You know, she's using her knowledge of obviously the regulatory landscape, the legal landscape, FDA's own words in, in on behalf of a pharmaceutical company trying to advocate uh, to keep the drug on the market. So it, it is like fairly rampant. In terms of like, you know, what sorts of rules and regulations there are, 
there's not really much, to be honest. There's been some efforts, at least through the political appointment process or through the nomination process by senators and by other folks in Congress to kind of put in some sort of rules, like a chilling period, usually after the person has left the FDA for a period of time um, to not go back immediately to industry, sort of a non-compete that's actually, you know, occurs. And, you know, FDA employees are supposed to um, disclose if they're like on the job market um, to go back to industry, um, you know, in a timely manner, you know, while they're sitting and making regulatory decisions over various industry products that they are on the market so they can be recused from certain decisions. But if we look at patterns, it's oftentimes like one month or two months before they actually depart. So you can imagine um, what sorts of um, influences or considerations there are there. I, I, I mean, there's a huge need for there to be rules around this across all levels of the FDA, um, for sure. But I think the other part of this too, and just more for a structural issue is like, you know, increased congressional appropriations to also make sure that FDA employees are adequately paid so that we can actually recruit great talent at the FDA to actually review things in a timely manner. Um, they lose folks to industry because industry can pay significantly more in many ways um, at the reviewer level process, especially, but also obviously with leadership too. And so I think, you know, pay parity is, is kind of maybe a long-term structural goal to kind of think about, but um, definitely having rules and regulations, especially with leadership that kind of signs, you know, their name on the dotted line and a number of approvals and big FDA regulatory decisions is absolutely needed now more than ever. Yeah, I, I think it's not the fact that they go work with them, for them. It's the fact that while they're at FDA, they're thinking about going to work for them. Mm -hmm. And right. the question is, are you going to be willing to stand up to who you see as your future employer? Right. And I don't mean to pillory yeah. anybody's motivations because I don't have ESP and I don't know what their motivations are, but one could at least hypothesize that that might be an issue. Auditioning. <laughs> um, what, so um, David Eagleman is suggesting that uh, because it's often a single FDA person um, who has the primary role in negotiating uh, a, a single uh, job that perhaps the process should include a second FDA person whose job it is to represent the public as a devil's advocate on each drug and device. And notes that there is a publication um, on this by Janice in 1964. Um, I, I will answer the question just came up, Adrian. Um, yes. FDA salaries are actually pretty good compared to academics. I'm one of the few people who went from an academic research career to FDA and left again. And I took a pretty substantial pay cut to leave, let me tell you. So um, they do try in terms of government salaries, at least. The FDA is better than most um, in terms of trying to compete. Now, obviously they're not gonna pay what an executive in a pharmaceutical company does. But if you stack them up against um, you know, what other people in, in government jobs are making. It's pretty good. Um, Don, Don Light wanted to uh, address the issue of labeling and, um, and notes that, um, that, that a lot of people don't know that the labels for FDA approved drugs are largely company labels that are legitimated by the FDA. So I think people mm -hmm. don't know that, mm -hmm. that the labels are, um, yeah. are negotiated between the company and the FDA. I'm not sure that there's more to say about that, but does anyone have a comment? I just have to say, I agree with Don. When I went, was I, I worked at FDA for a decade and that was the most surprising thing to me. <laughs> when we got to the decision to approve a drug. I thought, well, we'll just sit and write the label. And it was a negotiating process back and forth. And I have to say that really surprised me the first time I went through it because I didn't think that that made a whole lot of sense. The evidence is what the evidence is. Yeah, the, the uh, company gives you the, the first template, right? And you're so understaffed, it's like, great. <laughs> right, and, so. and one of the other things that people don't understand is companies actually want every possible side effect put into the label. And the right. reason they want that is because then they're indemnified against being sued. So right, right. it'll say, you know, your tongue issues and your eyelashes grow long, you know, so just to make sure. So it's not very helpful to practicing clinicians or patients. Have you seen any efforts by the FDA to reform itself? I think internally, yes. Um, it depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about individual um, drug applications, et cetera, there are actually review panels where if there's disagreements even within the FDA that they can bring that to a higher level and have a discussion about those things. And I think we should give people inside the FDA credit for that. Yeah. 
Um, on the bigger structural issues that Reshma brought up, those are things that really need congressional action and an individual person at FDA isn't gonna be able to affect those. But I, I think we sell too short the individual FDA scientists ability to try to do the job as best that they can under the conditions that they have. Yeah, definitely, I, I agree with that in many ways. Um, like for instance, when we think about things like real world evidence or real world data, which are emerging more and more, you know, FDA has actually taken a very like cautious approach um, based on their experience in looking at what sorts of studies are being submitted to them um, that are, you know, real world evidence sort of studies. And even just recently, you know, the head of the biostatistics department kind of like noted, noted like all these like challenges with real world evidence. And it's reflected, I think, in the guidances. You see that internally, like FDA folks are really trying to do the right thing in terms of making recommendations. When it comes to individual drug approvals, there's other considerations and other forces at play. And you know that oftentimes, you know, some of the more egregious actions we kind of see there that there are like voices within FDA that are kind of talking about dissent, maybe with a larger decision. And I think those voices are important to amplify because that's oftentimes reflecting the science and not necessarily the political landscape that might be driving you know, an approval decision. Yeah, if you look at Etta Plerson, um, what's interesting about Etta Plerson was that that entire review was released, 200 pages worth. And you see that the reviewer was against approval, the division director was against approval, the yeah. office director was against approval, and yeah. it gets approved. Yeah. And that gets to the question that Joel Lechkin just asked. I actually don't think it's as much the commissioner who drives oh, these decisions. Read the question for it. The question is how oh, much does, how much does the, politicization, does the politicization of the appointment of the FDA commissioner affect the policies adopted by the FDA? I think it's more the senior managers that have been there for a long, long time. Um, and you know, I actually, in my day job, work with um, a Department of Defense research network. And I always joke that one of the good things and the bad things about the Department of Defense is the guy I'm working with changes every three years. But I have learned over time, that's a good thing um, because it sort of brings new ideas and new blood into it. And when you look at some of the people who have been at FDA, they've been there for 30 years or longer. Yeah. And I think they have a bigger influence on FDA policy than a commissioner who leaves every couple of years. Yeah, it's true. Um, from Arthur Allen, is there a sense that pharma's role in improving FDA's well-being through PDUFA affected culture at the agency? Is being a bit more comfortable, has that made FDA officials more likely to be less confrontational with pharma? I, I don't know that there's ever been an appetite mm. to be confrontational. Yeah. Um, Interesting. I, I, uh, I, I, remember, <laughs> I remember when I would ask questions at meetings sometimes, I would be told that I was being rude to the pharmaceutical sponsor, and it's not rudeness, it's asking, well, can you verify this data? I always thought that was part of the job, right? So, um, I, and I don't think you should be confrontational per se, but you should certainly ask the questions that need to be asked. Um, you know, the first um, new drug application I got was 365 volumes long and they were all this thick. Yeah. So what ends up happening is you get buried with information, but you know what I found? The stuff I really wanted to know wasn't in there. So I had to write emails back to the sponsor asking, could you please do these additional analyses or come up with this other information? So um, it's a challenge, you know, when you're handed that much information, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, and I don't think that's being confrontational. I think that's what you would do if you were in journal club and somebody was presenting a paper, you'd ask the relevant questions. I think, I mean, to the larger kind of all, the point I think Arthur's also bringing up in terms of can we do a comparison of kind of before and after user fees or before and after user fees like balloon to what they are now. It's, you know, it's hard to kind of, you know, do that sort of comparison, but I, I think there's like some signs of this too in terms of FDA also having its like hands tied by how the user fee negotiations have kind of dictated their roles and responsibilities around expedited review pathways with the level of evidence that's acceptable for you know, approval based on some of these pathways. I think that's not necessarily made them less confrontational. It's just they, they know that under legislation um, that these standards have been like put forward that allows for approval and trying to move away from that has been increasingly difficult. Um, so I think there is like that sort of, yeah, definitely like 
what we've heard from like FDA officials and like Matt Herter, who's done a great qualitative study, you can he like in the interviews that he had, you can hear from FDA folks like the user fees pay for X, Y, and Z, and it's very explicit. In what well, that's how your for. time is organized. So when exactly. I, when I was an FDA reviewer. I had timelines I had to follow to get a new drug reviewed on time. I had a cadre of old drugs that I was supposed to be following for safety stuff. No one ever asked me about those. I was only asked about keeping on time for new drug applications. So, and that is because of what Reshma said, that's what the user fees go for. So that's what you're held accountable for. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Sharon Bat, which is what was the most difficult part of the report to write? Well, it, it was it was really fun actually to go down all these rabbit holes because that's what I like to do. Um, what was difficult was was trying to get it out in in a timely way, which um, I didn't do <laughs> because it's quite thorough. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know that there was anything that was really all that difficult. It was really a matter of just doing some um, you know some pretty comprehensive research. Yeah. Oh. So I think we have time just for uh, one last question, and I think this is a great one to end on, which is, what can we actually do to affect change? There are lots of good ideas, but what can we do to make the changes happen? So I'll just say, I mean, there's just kind of an immediate um, like policy window right now with the end of your spending bill. And, you know, you will hear this on multiple calls of like, yes, talk to your legislators. Yes, I mean this, like talk to your legislators about some of these reforms that are being discussed. And it is kind of, it's like remarkable to see that these reforms are actually being discussed. And so it's important to make sure like things like Agile Helm or McKenna are not just one-offs or considered exceptions, but mm -hmm. really a part of this pattern that's happened at FDA and to make Congress cognizant that changes need to happen to prevent these sorts of harms, both medically mm -hmm. and financially from continuing to happen to our patients. So definitely I will say, you know, putting that out there, talk to your legislators, especially mm -hmm. before the end of year spending bill, and happy to um, be a resource for folks um, on that as well. With Doctors for America, we do a lot of advocacy work around this um, and are a platform um, with a number of other groups. But um, we'd, you know, we'd love to have as many people as possible talking to legislators about issues related to reforming the FDA. I think there's also a day-to-day -day thing. Um, and, and we actually saw this with Agihelm. Don't use this stuff and don't give it to your patients. No, right? don't ask for it. it, it no. I thought it was very encouraging, no. Agihelm, that doctors were not prescribing this because they were aware that the evidence was insufficient. What Sharon brought up as a part of the report that we point out is physicians and patients aren't aware that the evidence is insufficient for a lot of these products, not just Agihelm. And I remember talking to the advisory committee members who resigned after that saying, what's so different about Agihelm? Why aren't we more concerned about the broader issue, not just with that drug in particular? And I, I was gratifying though to see, and I won't, if the evidence isn't sufficient, I'm not giving this stuff. As I jokingly say to my patients, it ain't my job to prescribe poison. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you all very much. This was really a wonderful webinar. Um, and um, thank, thank you to all of the attendees. And uh, please, please consider coming to our conference in June. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll be more great speeches. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye.